Um, I want to thank uh, uh, INET the, uh, for organizing this conference and Rob Johnson who introduced the session for all his efforts. Uh, he's dealing with a lot of academics here, which I, I think you know, probably is an experience he hasn't had in a while. And those of us who are academics know how challenging that is. The herding cats is the uh, expression. Uh, George Soros, obviously, for uh, his uh, vision and trying to challenge the orthodoxy and uh, shake things up and to this uh, distinguished audience. I'm not going to actually to attempt to uh, follow on too much about uh, Richard's uh, present, interesting presentation. I've uh, certainly seen his writings and they're, and they're very interesting. Um, we can talk about it later in the discussion, but I will just mention you know, a few things. Um, I mean, there's a, uh, certainly on the minus side, I, I don't think Japanese monetary policy was close to being satisfactory over this period. It was a disaster. And it wasn't just about bringing interest rates down to zero. It was a failure to adopt some form of inflation targeting, to have inflation expectations anchored too low. You can argue, as Olivier Blanchard, the chief economist now at the International Monetary Fund, where I used to be, uh, has argued that even the United States has inflationary expectations anchored too low at 2 percent. But that's a correction that the Japanese were reluctant to make and was probably a mistake. I mentioned the be nice to banks policy. You know, if a lot of countries have financial crises, they can't just borrow and borrow and borrow to deal with it. Japan was in a position to be able to do that. And that had its advantages, but also had its disadvantages, as I think we'll eventually see. Uh, I would also mention the rise of China in the case of Japan. This is a huge real shock. And certainly in all the literature now we have on banking crises, a number of scholars are revisiting various crises to say, well, wait, 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 was it really just a banking crisis? Was there something deeper going on? Uh, Carmen and I would say a short answer that there's always something deeper going on that sets things off. The banking crisis is typically an amplification mechanism. Uh, there was a paper recently presented at the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, by uh, Linda Tisar and uh, co-authors uh, saying, you know, what happened in Finland, the, the fall of the Soviet Union is really what happened to Finland, and it was headed for trouble no matter what, and people have overstated uh, the, uh, the banking crisis. Um, I, uh, I, I, I do want to use um, uh, Richard's presentation maybe as a point of departure for talking about some of the things where people say economists have nothing to say about X. This isn't in economic models and we deserve a lot of that but I also think there's some extent to which there, it's an overstatement. If I can just step back and say what I think the broad picture is in the state of macroeconomics uh, at the moment it's really that after, the Keynes, after Keynes and after the Great Depression, uh, Keynes introduced the idea that price might not always move to make demand equal supply. That's really at the root of everything here. And we have these really complicated models now where there are lots of prices for lots of things and these uh, arrow de Bru models with all kinds of state contingencies where you can sell your future income forward, you can sell your children's future income forward, uh, you can do anything, and of course they don't exist. There's this abstraction. We've, uh, we, we, we've kept that, but what Keynes focused on was particularly how wages and the prices in goods markets didn't clear. And economists quarreled over this for a long time. There have actually been uh, you know, a huge wave in the 70s and 80s that many of you are familiar with, uh, Bob Lucas, uh, uh, Ed Prescott, Finn Kidlin, Nobel Prizes for the showing it was the Keynes was complete garbage. We really can explain everything with supply equals demand. There was nothing you know to worry about. We just didn't have complicated enough models. We didn't have sophisticated enough models. And there were great contributions there, but I'd actually say the profession eventually settled on a truce, saying, "Let's take the neat." Uh, complicated, uh, complicated innovations that were brought in technically, but let's let's not say demand always equals supply. Let's <coughs> acknowledge that we can have excess demand or supply in the labor markets and find a way to deal with it. Now, th that's not actually very easy for us to do because if you reduce economics at the end, it's about there's demand and supply, and price makes demand equal supply. 
and if you don't have the price move, you need some other story, which we don't have. And we actually never arrived at it for wages and prices. We never quite had a fully satisfactory, George Akerlof is sitting here, has an important contribution about uh, near rational expectations being uh, an explanation of what might be going on. My colleague Greg Mankiw had an idea about menu costs. But I would, I would say that you know, these are pieces of a solution. And it, we really arrived at a consensus. There was a truce just saying, OK, we just don't come close to explaining anything we want to explain if we don't do this. So most people have some form of price rigidity in their model. But on financial markets, uh, the majority of the profession use these models with absolutely unimaginably perfect financial markets. I'm not even talking about like you see today, like you can't even conceive of that any possible trade has been made. You say, why would they do that? And it, it turns out, if you think about it a lot, it's a huge simplification when there's no little market in the background that's not clearing that I need to figure out what's going on with. It's just a huge simplification. And the real business cycle theorist said, uh, it's useful, it's fine, it's approximately true. Well, and, and we had the great moderation, supposedly. And well, I, I think the financial crisis really ended that idea. And so probably the next stage of macroeconomics is thinking about a way to deal with these imperfections in financial markets. How do we think about it? Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be something we're going to solve in a year or two or even a decade or two. Because at the end of the day, it's very hard for us to get away from this demand equal supp supply and price clears the market. We're going to have to arrive at a convention, a truce, like, we've ha like we have on, on price rigidities uh, for dealing with this. Now, that's not to say such models don't exist. I work in international economics. We never had that in international economics. Countries default on their debt all the time. And you just be crazy. You just can't have a model of anything without having that. And if you look beyond the richest economies, it's obvious they have financial crises all the time. And again, the idea of having absolutely perfect financial markets is ludicrous. Um, but there were important scholars doing it. This Ben Bernanke's most famous paper is very much about the importance of collateral constraints, the collapse of credit markets is 1983. American Economic Review paper that was very influential. And it led later to a number of scholars, uh, Bernanke and Gertler, Kiyotaki and Moore and many others, developing these models that emphasize the importance of collateral. Uh, uh, Rich, Richard's uh, balance sheet recessions are certainly, at the very least, close cousins of these models. Uh, they're trying to capture a similar idea. Now, the failing of these models is that because they, in a sense, got away from demand <coughs> equal supply, they introduced private information and other devices for doing that. It was very hard to calibrate them. It was very hard to generalize them. They were very special. There was a lot of evidence showing they were important, that the idea of collateral balance sheets was important. We see that in normal recessions. Small and medium-sized firms suffered disproportionately because their access to credit is lost, they're forced to consolidate more. So really, th there's even evidence on the importance of this in, in uh, normal recessions. And there were these models, but it was very hard to, to uh, calibrate them. And I, and I want to sort of turn to a little branch of economics, which I think has something to say about this, which is introducing uh, economic history and looking at financial crises. And that's what I've been working on with uh, Carmen Reinhart recently. And I think that this also speaks to a little bit about the sociology of, of, uh, of economics. The, I first want to say there are many really superb scholars who've long been doing research in uh, financial uh, history. And just to name a few, and it's only a few, uh, Barry Eichengreen, Michael Bordo, Alan Taylor, <coughs> Peter Linder, all work in the international field. Uh, Christina Romer, of course, who's at the Council of Economic Advisors, my colleague Claudia Golden. Uh, it's an important field. There was David Landis wrote, wrote a, at Harvard, wrote a wonderful book, but it is marginalized. I mean, it is so hard to get through a history deport appointment in any department these days. Those of you who are in departments are shaking your heads knowingly. I mean, will we have one? No, one's too many. There are a lot of departments that just don't <laughs> offer it. 
and I think you know that's an example of something where maybe the inward looking nature, the triumphalism of uh, theoretical macroeconomics maybe has had a little bit too much influence. Uh, I think in fact uh, history has a lot to say for a very per uh, particular reason here, which is that when we look at these very rare events, it's very hard to calibrate them on normal uh, data. Uh, it's, even if you had the right model, even if you had the perfect model and you knew, we were 40 years from now and you knew uh, what the truth was with financial markets, you still have to calibrate it and these unusual events are very non-linear and they're not easy to calibrate on our normal methodologies, it's difficult. And history gives you a perspective on this calibration of what happens in these un unusual events. I'd say a related problem is uh, a rejection largely by the profession of looking at cross-country empirical analysis. Now this isn't as marginalized as history. You will find people you know, doing this. But there are, there are a lot of technical problems. Don't kid yourself, I won't go into them, but there are a lot with the heterogeneity of the data and technical problems about uh, uh, looking at uh, just having uh, that we even see in labor uh, economics and public finance. But that, that wasn't why it was marginalized. It, it's been marginalized because people say the US is different, it's better. I, why, why would you look at a country like the United States or Great Britain and uh, have uh, you know, Finland in the same regression? I mean, it's so different. Uh, it doesn't make sense. What could I possibly learn from that? Sorry to pick on anyone Finnish in the audience. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that was just overblown, that there was some legitimate criticism. But again, if you want to look at unusual events, if you want to look at out-of-bounds events, it's helpful to have a broader perspective to bring these things in. So Carmen Reinhardt and I began work on our book, This Time is Different, uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, it involved putting together a massive historical data set, but then also trying to filter through it to think of what to look at. And uh, my, my co-author has uh, really been a pioneer in this, who'd been doing things uh, from before when we started working together, looking at financial crises in the 1990s uh, and, uh, and other events. And one of the things is we put together this data set that just amazed us was how much the United States seemed to be driving down the tracks of a deep crisis. Now, we wrote our first paper on that before the crisis, before Lehman, that the US had everything lined up to look like a typical crisis, looking at the usual indicators of uh, leverage, uh, what was happening to housing prices, equity prices, uh, government borrowing, and other, uh, other indicators showed this vulnerability. And we, we, we have a chapter in our book, but we actually released a paper about this early. And then after the crisis, the US has been driving down the tracks of a typical post-financial crisis situation. The stock market's recovering. It's been faster, but it's quite normal. In fact, we often find Japan being a notable exception that, uh, that equity prices uh, come back. And I, I, I could go on for a lot longer about, uh, about our work, but I would just give it as an example of turning to history. And I should have mentioned my colleague at Harvard, Neil Ferguson, who's done wonderful work, uh, uh, turning to history to try to get some perspective on the present. You don't want to I don't want to throw out theoretical macroeconomics or finance to do that. That's absurd. But I think that these exercises had just been marginalized uh, uh, really uh, for, for too long. Now, um, I want to talk about the issue of long-term debt. I think that's an interesting policy issue. Um, and one of the things Reinhardt and I find is that when you come out of a financial crisis, long-term debt explodes. Again, the US, Britain are actually just on the norm of these, uh, uh, or the, the US exactly, so Britain maybe will pass it on the norm of wh where you go after a deep financial crisis. We think what we did was so innovative, was so original, but everybody tries to do everything they can to, uh, to deal with the crisis, the fall off in tax revenues, the bank bailouts. And I think the, the question is, is the, the trade-off between what you're doing in the short run and the long run, the extent to which you deal with the panic, uh, to the extent to which you don't. Um, I, I could go on for a very long time about w what I think the balance of things are, but my take on what was done 
was that the uh, backstopping the banking system and stopping the panic was point one of what brought us out of the crisis. I mean, we're, I don't think we're in for a situation of galloping growth in the developed world, and I completely agree with Richard on this it, for lots of reasons, maybe in emerging markets, not in the, in the developed world. I don't think we're in, in for galloping growth. But, um, you know, it, at, uh, at the same time, it could have been a lot, lot worse, and that was helpful. And I actually think the monetary policy, which was commingled with fiscal policy, monetary policy, the quantitative easing was really fiscal policy, uh, was very important. I think the government spending was the right thing to do for confidence, for maintaining output. But Paul Samuelson is my teacher at MIT, and I very much uh, agree with uh, what he, he said about that uh, you have to have some discipline in allocating resources. And I think to the extent uh, government stand spending is just rising, uh, in a, a way that's not going to get reined in very easily is not a great idea. And my colleague Robert Barrow's written about this a lot. I don't necessarily uh, uh, adopt every view of his on it, but a main point in his writing is it depends on what you spend the money on. If you're spending the money on some fantastic infrastructure project that's going to make your economy really productive, that's great. I live in Boston, the big dig. I don't know if you've ever passed through Boston. It's the most expensive infrastructure project in history. Um, I used to like to take my five-year-old son down there. He loved work watching diggers. I mean, it just thrilled him. We would take the subway down, and they'd be digging up the dirt. It just thrilled him. And I, I was used to love how there was one guy working, seven guys standing around watching him, not counting the policemen and the others. We spent $20 billion on it, uh, you know, the original estimate was a quarter of that. But we have a debate in Boston about, well, you know, maybe it was worth $20 billion if you knew it was going to cost that. But anyway, it really depends on your country, your culture, your situation, what the project is. I think uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the balance, uh, there, there, there's a balance in these things. What is the risk if you build up debt? And I think that's an important question for both the U.S. and Britain. There does reach a point, there is a ceiling somewhere. And by the way, I think Japan will find it soon enough. Uh, there is a ceiling somewhere where you do start to pay a premium. Now, right now, real interest rates are very low. World real interest rates are pretty low. That, but that, that can change. They're very unpredictable. And debt cannot change quickly. And you can run into a situation where you're forced to raise taxes. I don't, I don't expect the United States of Britain ever to be Greece. But it's not pleasant to get to be in a situation where interest rates are rising quickly, where you're having to pay much more on your short-term debt quickly uh, the, when you're talking about these big uh, debt numbers. And Reinhardt and I look at this uh, in, our, in our work and find that when you start getting into debt-GDP ratios of 90 to 100 percent, it can weigh on growth. Now, w uh, uh, I'm not saying she'd say the same thing as me, uh, but neither of us, I think, would say, you know, just pull the plug, just forget it. That, that would be insane. We don't know what caused the crisis. That's why we're here. Um, we, we don't know quite what fixed it. I gave my opinion. I view fiscal policy as the third leg. But, you know, I wouldn't want to pull the plug just to make, you know, just to prove that I was right, that it didn't matter. I think it's something that should be done slowly. I do think a determined effort to try to consolidate finances is very much at the top of the agenda uh, in the United States and Britain today. And uh, I think how both countries confront that challenge is going to be very important for how they fare in the, in the next couple decades. Okay, let me just uh, conclude with a little bit more about the, um, the, you know, the, the general issue of the, uh, of the conference. So my, my work with Carmen is really back to the future. We use approaches like Arthur Bur uh, Burns and Mitchell used. Uh, we're looking at historical analysis that's been diminished in mainstream economics, but it's not something nobody's ever thought of. But I would hardly say that just because of the financial crisis that mainstream economics is just a disaster, we should throw it out. There, there are an awful lot of successes. I uh, could point to auction theory which has helped in many ways in the private sector. Governments uh, bid out the uh, cell and uh, internet spectrum. Labor economics has had a lot of success in 
using big uh, data sets and new computing techniques and trying to understand the nature of unemployment, which I think we understand a lot about. A lot about. And I, I, could, I could go on and on. I mean, I think there have been many successes. It's a question of reining in areas of hubris. It's a question of being open to new ideas and open to old ideas uh, because of uh, trends and fashions that have been lost. Um, I even would say, I mentioned that uh, people say we're not good at forecasting. We actually are kind of good at building models that say we can't forecast. Um, we have models of bubbles and multiple equilibria that are completely within conventional uh, macroeconomics uh, where you just have nonlinearities, nonconvexities, and complete markets, and these bubbles jump out. And the, the nature of them is they're self-fulfilling expectations. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure this is right, but I would think there's some parallel to what George Soros calls uh, reflexivity. Um, they're, they're a limit of our models, and it doesn't say we stop there. We'd like to fill it in. There's an agenda to try to fill that in, but uh, it, it stands before us. So let me just uh, 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 conclude by saying that I think the big issue on the macro agenda today is to find a way to deal with the imperfections of financial markets that uh, is parallel to how we've achieved uh, things with good markets. Even the models we have today do tell us something about when bubbles are more likely, when crises are more likely. Carmen and I find that if you have a ton of short-term debt, you're in deeper hot water, you're, you're, you're in worse trouble than if you have a ton of long-term debt. You're much more susceptible to a crisis of confidence. Uh, there, are, there are certainly you know, lessons if you uh, have huge government deficits one year after another and you do it uh, 20 years in a row, you will run, in, run into trouble. I mean, you're more likely to, to see a bubble. It's not completely vacuous. But I do think uh, this, uh, what INET offers of um, trying to prick the conservativeness of mainstream economics is something that's very valuable. And I uh, look forward to hearing about the discussions from these two days. Thank you. <laughs>